Greetings colleagues, fellow teachers and educators around the world. I'm Nikos Sifakis. What do we mean when we use the term communicative context? On today's Everything English Language Teaching, we are going to find out exactly what we mean and I'm going to give you a very easy way to make sure that we remember it. So, what is communicative context? We often encounter the term when we refer to a communicative event or situation involving two or more people interacting. We have a sense of understanding what it means. It's everything that has to do with the interaction, isn't it? Well, yes, it is. But we are never sure what should be included in this description. It's a rather fuzzy term. And yet, we know that this is an important aspect of our teaching. We need to be able to establish the communicative context of all tasks, whether they are our own original tasks or the textbooks, to ensure that the tasks are authentic, realistic and motivating for our learners. So, communicative context is important for teaching. So, I'll explain everything. But in order to understand the necessity of communicative context, we need to trace it back to how it started. How was the term developed? Well, everything begins with the primordial human need to communicate through language. In order to achieve successful communication, we need to be in the know, to have the skills that are essential for communication. We need to be competent. But there are different kinds of competence. One such kind is the so-called linguistic competence, which refers to the mental representations of linguistic rules that constitute the native speaker's internal grammar and are evidenced in their intuitions about the grammaticality of sentences. This linguistic competence is very helpful for understanding how the human mind processes language, but its study is not interested in acts of communication or interaction between people. That's what the term performance was intended to describe. But as we soon found out, and all this took place in the late 1960s and early 1970s, performance was not simple an automatic translation of competence into communicative act. In order to communicate effectively, it is argued, we also need a different form of competence, what Himes called communicative competence. In its original form, communicative competence refers to the knowledge that people have of what constitutes correct, appropriate and, perhaps most importantly, effective language behaviour. These three characteristics are basic for successful communication. Correctness refers to the levels of structural accuracy and functional fluency that correspond to the needs of each communicative exchange. Appropriacy corresponds to those discourse elements that render our discourse socially and culturally acceptable by other participants at each given moment. Uh, these issues are studied by pragmatics. And finally, Effectiveness corresponds to the characteristics of discourse that make it intelligible or comprehensible to other participants. This means that communicative competence can be broken down into a series of further competences, each responsible for a different aspect of communication. So, for example, one aspect of communicative competence deals with the ability to combine words and sentences to make a communicative point, and this is known as discourse competence. Another form of communicative competence is responsible for establishing our identity and expressing our culture, uh, known as intercultural competence. 
And of course, you need to deal with unexpected problems or obstacles in your interactions and to keep the channel of communication open and that strategic competence. What all of these types of communicative competence show uh, is that communication is demanding. It is not an easy field to understand and to deal with. Things happen when we use language and it's really important for our learners to be on top of every interaction. To have the knowledge, the skills, the attitudes, in essence the competence required to address every issue that arises. So what's in a communicative situation? What are its distinctive features and what should a competent user of English be aware of? More importantly, what should we as teachers take into consideration when we develop communicative tasks? Del Himes describes eight attributes of every written and spoken communicative situation. Not only that, he came up with a very easy way to remember um, an acronym for these attributes. The acronym is SPEAKING. S-P-E-A-K-I-N-G, and the different parameters that describe communicative events begin with one of these letters. So the first feature is dual. It's the setting and the scene of the communicative event. Setting refers to the time and place of a communicative event, and in general, to the physical circumstances or surroundings. For example, the living room in the grandparents' home might be a setting for a family story. Scene is the psychological and cultural makeup of the people involved in that particular situation. Scene includes characteristics such as the range of formality exhibited or the physical relation of the participants. In our example, the family story may be told at a reunion celebrating the grandparents' anniversary. And at times the family would be festive and playful, at other times serious and commemorative. The second feature is a description of the participants in this event. It's the P. These are the addresser, the speaker or writer producing the utterance, the addressee, the recipient or recipients of the utterance, that is the persons uh, or person at whom the utterance is addressed, and the audience, possible overhearers who may not be directly related to the event, but whose existence may contribute to its specification. At the family reunion, an aunt might tell a story to the young female relatives, but males, although not addressed directly, might also hear the narrative. Knowing who the participants are, for example their age, gender, status and social relationships, is essential for understanding the linguistic choices that they make. So this is an interesting parameter. The next feature is called ends. These refer to the purpose of each communication and concern the addresser's intended goals and expected outcomes with regard to the addressee or addressees and the audience. In our example, the aunt may tell a story about the grandmother uh, in order to entertain the audience, teach the young wom women and honour the grandmother. The fourth feature of communicative events is the series of, of act sequences. Act sequences spell out the form and the content of the event and the order of its various stages. In daily interactions, certain forms are conventionally used for certain types of interactions. Uh, in our example, the aunt's story might begin as a response to a toast to the grandmother. The plot of the story and its development would have a sequence structured by the aunt. Possibly, there would be a collaborative interruption during the storytelling by the audience. And finally, the group might applaud the tale and move, move on to another subject or activity. The fifth feature is called key. 
According to Himes, this feature refers to cues that establish the tone, manner, or spirit of the way a communicative event is performed. For example, the aunt might imitate the grandmother's voice and gestures in a playful way, or she might address the group in a serious voice, emphasizing the sincerity and respect of the praise that her story expresses. The key need not be only verbal, but may be accompanied by facial expressions, gestures, and so on. The next feature is called instrumentalities. These refer to the medium of transmission, auditory, visual channels, and the forms and styles of speech used. So, the aunt might speak in a casual register with many dialect features, or she might use a more formal register and careful grammatical standard forms. Two more features. Norms. These are the social and cultural conditions which govern the event and account for the participants' actions and reactions. They essentially define what is and what is not appropriate or expected. For example, the rules of turn-taking, who speaks when during an interaction. In a playful story by the aunt, the norms might allow many audience interruptions and collaboration, or possibly those interruptions might be limited to participation by older females only. A serious formal story by the aunt might call for attention to her and allow for no interruptions. The last feature in this list is probably uh, the most interesting and complicated of all. It's called genre. Genres are different kinds of uh, um, speech acts or events that are associated with uh, particular communicative situations. For example, poems, myths, news broadcasts, lectures, sermons, and so on. What is more, each genre has specific formal characteristics as far as the form, content, or delivery style are concerned. In our example, the aunt might choose to tell um, a character anecdote about the grandmother in order to entertain, or she may choose to recite a more detached story as moral instruction. Without recourse to each and every one of the above eight categories, it's impossible to form a comprehensive understanding of the specifics of uh, a communicative event. These categories are a very productive and powerful tool of making sense of the textual, situational, and socio-cultural characteristics of such events that have different demands on a person's communicative competence. They do so by allowing us to refer to both general as well as more specific aspects of such events. For example, the general aspects may refer to the participant's role and status, their choice of formal or informal discourse, or their attitudes, uh, emotions, inferencing procedures, cultural and uh, world knowledge, and perception of the communicative situation. On the other hand, the specific aspects may refer to the gestures and paralinguistic features, uh, for example, the tone of voice, facial characteristics, speed of delivery, and so on. In essence, Himes's speaking categories allow for a comprehensive understanding of both language uses and language users in different individual communicative situations. For that reason, they are an excellent tool for the language teacher as well. What are your own thoughts on these categorizations of communicative context and of the different competence types? Do you find them uh, useful in designing uh, or evaluating or adapting language learning activities in your own teaching context? Write your thoughts in the comments below. As always, I look forward to reading your comments uh, and, and seeing your perspective and also uh, communicating with you. Bye for now.